We're in a series on Mary, so if you would, we're going to dive right in and kind of get going. So turn with me, if you would, to the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. And we're talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus, and it's kind of a fun series for me. It's, it's a unique way to get at a couple just different aspects of church, church history, and things that, that we normally wouldn't get to talk about. So it's kind of fun. I'm enjoying it. And this, uh, this morning, we're going to talk about art first and then just a second. So it's kind of a fun Sunday. Mary as a lens to kind of look at art and then justice. So in, in uh, Luke, we see towards the end, after the angel Gabriel has talked to Mary about what's going to transpire uh, with the birth of Jesus, she then uh, goes and visits her sister Elizabeth. And then towards the end of that, we get what is called Mary's song, which is... Um, which is Mary kind of reflecting on all of this and bursting out in song. And we have that recorded for us in Scripture. And it's a fascinating little psalm, if you will. And it's that that I want to kind of speak on this morning. So in verse 46, we see the beginning of Mary's song, Luke chapter 1, verse 46. And I'm just going to read through uh, the beginning part, and then we'll get to the, the latter parts later. But it says this, My soul glorifies the Lord, And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. It's it's not just kind of um, spiritual words or empty words when Mary says that. It's in some ways prophetic when she says that all generations will call her blessed. Uh, from now on. And what we see is we see that visually expressed probably better in art than in any other way because Mary, the mother of Jesus, um, and nobody disputes this, is hands down the most depicted female in the history of art ever with, with nobody even a close second. And so you, when you think of kind of what God is doing with this idea of um, the small peasant gal that he has chosen to bestow favor on, and then somehow she ends up the most depicted human uh, female in, in history, uh, in art, you kind of realize something really big is going on. I don't think it's just because, well, the Catholic Church is big, so of course Mary would be uh, the most depicted. It's like, no, if you start at the beginning with who Mary was, and then who, who the early church was as well with regard to its status within Roman culture and within the empire. It really is an amazing thing how this kind of journey goes. So I want to walk us through it uh, quickly and kind of be able to show some of this. But what we see is, uh, this is um, from about 250, what many would call the first depiction of Mary that we have, um, which was found beneath St. Peter's when they were kind of excavating down beneath there. And... Um, and so you see that initially it wasn't that there was a lot of artwork about Mary, but it kind of begins later on in the church. And then it was the Edict of Milan in, in around uh, 313 when the Emperor Constantine allowed for the freedom of religion that you see greater artwork come about. And then eventually in 431 when the Council of Ephesus, we talked about this last week, named Mary Theotokos, which literally means the, uh, the mother of a god or god-bearer, that when she kind of came into this status or this title, she became an object of art in a much more significant way. So what you see from that point forward is the growth of icons. So small painted depictions of Mary. Uh, you see um, kind of religious art and carvings. And uh, that's carving. This is more of a manuscript Um, plate and manuscript plates so you see kind of Mary begin to get depicted in these different kinds of ways and a lot of them are portable mediums so that uh, they could travel with people people were having depictions of Mary with them and in an illiterate culture uh, the visual representations are a huge thing with regard to storytelling so art was a way of of teaching for most of church history until um, the Gutenberg press, and you see this real strong growth in literacy and, and books. 
So the, the emphasis being at this point in time on the status of Mary, uh, where she is, and that we can take her kind of in some sense with us. And then you see the growth of kind of the Byzantine way of getting at Mary, which is all about the symbolism, not necessarily the realistic style of art, but it's, it's showing her status with regards to um, kind of a flattened out picture and storytelling. Um, in the Byzantine era, we move into um, what would be known as, uh, this would be Mary, uh, the protector, protre- uh, protectress of the Roman people, and the Basilica de Santa Maria Majoria in Rome, which is the largest church in the world dedicated to Mary. This is believed to be one of what they call the Lucan paintings um, that's apocryphal, that this goes all the way back to Luke, the Apostle Luke, but it's probably dated uh, closer to the 5th century. And this gives birth um, to kind of a lot of different renditions of it. It's copied over and over. This is what's called one of the, um, one of the black Madonnas. And what you see in, uh, after the time of Augustine was that Scripture was read very metaphorically, very loosely, very allegorically. And so Mary was read into the Song of Solomon a lot. That uh, when it says she, this beautiful woman was dark, People kind of read into that, that the beautiful woman is kind of the, the type of woman, which must be Mary. And so you have kind of this growth of the black Madonna tradition. And by the way, uh, Madonna is the word, the Latin word for my lady. So I don't know if this will let me write, but um, Madonna simply means uh, my lady in Latin. And it's the same thing as the French uh, Notre Dame, which means Our Lady. Uh, so if you've ever wondered kind of where Madonna comes from. And we typically use the phrase Madonna um, for the pictures of Mary, whether it's with the baby Jesus or a grown Jesus. It's when Mary is depicted in artwork, we tend to use the phrase Madonna. So we have um, the growth of kind of the black Madonna images, uh, again, taken from a reading of Scripture and Song of Solomon. And then... Uh, When we move it forward, I'm going to kind of hurry it forward. We see after the church kind of accepts in 787 this idea that we're going to have the art of of Mary, that that it's not okay um, to talk bad about it, the Second Council of Nicaea, that that this is a, a protected thing. You see different forms of art with stained glass, um... And, and then uh, wood carvings, wood paintings. So these are wood panels that have different scenes on it. And again, being made for churches. So certainly in the late Byzantine era, the 700s on, the church was the major patron of the arts. So the church is funding art for the purposes of decorating its facilities, telling the stories of Christianity and the Gospels. And it wasn't until later on in the 1200s, 1300s, that you begin to see rich patrons uh, the emerging rich class in Europe, buying uh, the work of art and religious art for themselves. So it was kind of a status symbol that way. And so you, we kind of get a split in art here, which is where I'm going to end the story in just a minute. This is Leonardo da Vinci, Madonna on the Rocks. And so when you get to the 1400s and the beginnings, the rumblings of the Renaissance, you see uh, where they take the flatness of the image out and they begin to show the realism uh, in the human form and kind of revert back to uh, the classical view of things. Literature, also the growth of literature begins to force artists to want to do a little bit more of the storytelling and you begin to see mythological elements showing up inside uh, the kind of Christian artwork pieces. Again, the church is sponsoring a lot of this art, but the artists themselves are wanting to introduce Greek ideas, ideas from classical antiquity, um, I don't have a picture of it, but if you actually go to the Sistine Chapel and look up uh, at the Sistine Chapel, it has Michelangelo interspersed the prophets in Scripture with what, he, what, what are known as the Sibyls. So the, the, the non-religious people that were believed to be people that God spoke to in antiquity. So you actually have the, the prophet, I think it's Isaiah or Ezekiel, and right next to Ezekiel or Isaiah, you have the, uh, the oracle at Delphi. It's, just a, it's a really trippy thing, especially, again, for Protestants to be sitting there in the Sistine Chapel and to go, what is the oracle at Delphi? 
like doing right next to the prophet Ezekiel, and it was kind of an interspersing of these different things. And as Michelangelo was doing it, what he was trying to do is say, all of the, the people whom God has spoken to, I kind of want to re- represent this way, and, he, and he, he layers them. So this is Da Vinci, the beginning of uh, the Renaissance. And then we, we leave Da Vinci here. I'll show it only briefly. Um, I don't know how long I can show that picture in church, but that picture needs to be shown. It's, it's really the, the birth of, of the Renaissance, and what you see is, this is called The Birth of Venus by Botticelli, and now we've left all together doing pictures of Mary, the mother of Jesus, the Madonna, and we're, we're doing Greek mythology, and we're going back to humanism, and we've kind of left the world of the Bible, and so the Renaissance at this point really begins. This is the Hall of Wonders that was in uh, the Medici kind of offices in Florence. The Medici, again, the rich um, patrons. The uh, Botticelli's Birth of Venus was um, sponsored by Lorenzo de' Medici. And so you've got this whole kind of upheaval in art going on because you have rich, the rich Medici family basically um, bankrolling this and creating an art school. This is the Hall of Wonders where they collected all these, these things kind of in their own rooms. And it begins to be what, what would be known as kind of the first art museum in Europe where they would kind of show it off to people. You have a statue here which was where Botticelli uh, took and, and kind of did his painting of. So he was familiar with the Hall of Wonders, would have been in there a lot. And so the statue um, of Venus is kind of how he gets his inspiration for the birth of Venus um, art. So now this was then turned later into uh, basically the oldest art museum in the world, arguably one of the oldest art museums in the world, um, because the Medici left it to the city of Florence. So this is now kind of spread out in the old Medici offices. It's called the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, Uffizi being the word for offices, um, which is very simple that way. A lot of people wonder, I wonder this, it's just an aside, but how come uh, the Mona Lisa, if... Da Vinci was an Italian and was, was doing all this stuff. How come the Mona Lisa is not in one of these galleries? And he actually did that painting, what I was told, was in France and left it in his will to the French people. So that's why the Mona Lisa would be at the Louvre, if, um, if my sources are correct. So we see kind of um, all of art history being centered around certainly religious themes with a high priority on Mary, the mother of Jesus. And then when we get to... Um, the church no longer really being the patron of the arts, we see this kind of explosion back into classical and humanistic themes. Um, and then the, the depictions of Mary still continue, but then kind of come into modern art forms and even modern art. You go to the Church of the um, Annunciation in Nazareth, they've taken panels that they gave every country uh, the ability to do a representation of the Madonna and so you, you walk, and there's kind of uh, ceiling-long panels, one after the other. And the Japanese one has a Japanese Madonna. The Congolese one has a Cong, uh, kind of a Congo woman representing uh, Jesus, his mother, uh, the Mary. And so she continues on in artwork, but this is when um, her dominance with regard to art kind of ends. One more picture is the Pieta. This is Michelangelo's probably... Uh, some people would, would put it on par with the David, but certainly the next most uh, famous work of Michelangelo after the David, and it's one of the most priceless pieces of art in the world. It's actually inside St. Peter's. So you go inside St. Peter's Cathedral, and to the right, you have a little uh, nave, and you've got the Pieta there, Michelangelo's Pieta. And uh, it's actually been reconstructed because I think it was in the 90s, um, it would have been the 80s or the 90s, a guy went in there with a hammer and ran at the thing and started hammering it to bits uh, before they were able to pull him off it. So it's now protected behind plexiglass uh, and kind of been reconstructed hand in the foot of Jesus and whatnot. But so even with Michelangelo, as he was learning, this was earlier on in his career, kind of the first thing that really put him on the map, um, all artists in that time period uh, would have to do a, some kind of a rendition of the Madonna as part of their education, uh, improving themselves. So why, why do we bring up all of that? Because you come back to this verse, and, and it really is a wild thing for me to look at this verse and to say somehow when we see things in Scripture, 
there's a truism to that. I mean, we can talk about the art and, and Mary and the Madonna and this whole idea visually represented, but when we look at what she's saying in Scripture, the beginning of Luke, there's a truth to it, and it's a really uncanny thing to see how that works itself out uh, throughout history. Now, one of the problems with Protestants is that we tend to knee-jerk and say anything that had to do with the Catholic Church, we're going to set ourselves up in, in a whole different place from that. And, and we begin to lose sight that until arguably 1517 or 1521, uh, Luther's 95 Theses in 1517 or the Diet of Worms where he renounces or uh, fails to renounce his writings um, and you kind of get this schism that the Catholic Church is, is the, the one kind of unified Christian branch that the Reformation and Protestant faith kind of comes from. And so the other traditions, Eastern Orthodox and, and the Roman Catholic Church, say a lot to our history as Christians and say a lot to how Christianity from the time of Luke has worked itself out in this world. And we have to begin to, I think, go back in and study that part of history and understand the rich nuance that it brings to under, uh, our faith and when we see verses like this and that, uh, what God really did do through a peasant woman. So to me, a uh, very cool thing seeing how this, this aspect of Mary's song works itself into art history. And if we continue on with Mary's song, so again, if you've got your thumb in Luke chapter 1, we continue on and it says this in verse 50. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. And then verse 51, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. And he has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. And he has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble he has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and for his descendants forever and ever, even as he said to our, for, uh, to our fathers. So this whole idea of the prophecies coming true. Um, but I want to really camp on this verse and then the verses below it about his own arm working mighty deeds for him in his salvation. We see... Uh, this verse, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. Doesn't sound that big of a deal. It's very picturesque, but I'm going to kind of take us back to where we get it from in a minute. Um, and then he continues on, uh, or she continues on. He has brought down rulers. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the, uh, the rich away empty. So you see this, this song of Mary talking about the arm of God, the very little arm of God coming down and and in some strange way, working justice, bringing down the high, lifting up the low, and filling the hungry with the, the things that we all ought to have. We all ought to have the food. We all ought to have the shelter. We all ought to be able to live without fear for our very lives, um, uh, like on cold nights like last night. So she's talking about God working something with his arm, and that ultimately what comes from that is justice. Now, why that's so fascinating, so when I guest speak at places, I preach a sermon out of, out of Isaiah 59. So if you want to turn there with me, um, Isaiah 59, we see a whole lot barreled into a very short period here. So when I, when I go to places, I love to tell the story of Antioch. I love to bring your greetings to whoever I'm speaking to. And then I jump into Isaiah 59, and I pick it up um, in verse 14, there's a whole lot of references in chapter 59 to uh, justice. Chapter 58 is famous for being this kind of true fasting, true devotion to God, true pursuit of God. It's not just running harder and harder. It's not kind of religious, religiously contorting yourself. It's not, it's not effort. It's not all these things. It's really about your love for others. It says something profound about your love for God. Isaiah 58 before that, we see the suffering servant, this idea of, of Jesus as the, the suffering servant. And we get to 59, and it recaps all these things, and it talks about injustice being present because people have rebelled against God, literally turning away from God, that there's a, a correlation that when we turn away from God, injustice comes up. When we turn to God, it's a necessary part of that that justice happens. But the fact is, people have turned from God, so there is no justice. And then in verse 14, so Isaiah 59, verse 14, it says this, justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Again, Hebrew parallelism, where you see justice and righteousness used uh, synonymously. Uh, the, the Old Testament is, 
is replete with this kind of Hebrew parallelism where, where they use synonyms to restate things or underscore the same kind of idea. And we could do a whole sermon just about how those two words really are synonymous, justice and righteousness. But then it says this, truth has stumbled in the streets, honesty cannot enter. And so what I typically try and do uh, is get into defining justice, as we've done before here at Antioch, that justice is not just an ethical concept, that it's a universal concept like truth. For Christians, we, we understand this about truth. It's called the correspondence theory of truth, that truth is what corresponds to what is. Truth is what corresponds to what is. It's got a connection to reality. Whether I like truth or not, it doesn't matter. Truth doesn't care. It's, it's uncompromising. Whether I know truth or not, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change truth. Um, truth is its own thing. I joke about Pluto. Uh, my wife was talking about it a couple months ago, like that Pluto once was a planet, now it's not a planet. You guys remember that one? Um, has anyone read that? Or are you just out of the loop? Um, Pluto's not a planet anymore, in case you didn't know. And I joke, I'm like, you know, Pluto um, doesn't care whether, it, whether we think it's a planet or not. It never has cared um, and it has always existed. You know, it's there. And so whatever we think of it, whatever we call it, Pluto, the fact of Pluto, the reality of Pluto is really indifferent to our feelings or our thoughts. Does that make sense? Truth is what corresponds to what is. Most people understand that. Justice, likewise, is this universal concept that corresponds to what ought to be. Uh, it corresponds to God's intentions for creation, his will, his desire, his plan when he created things, um, such that when he looked at his creation and said that it was good, why was he able to say it was good? Well, because it reflected his, his ideas, his will, his plan. It reflected his beauty and his glory. And so he looks at this and he says, it is good. And so um, justice is what ought to be. Primary justice is a distinction of, of when things really are what they ought to be is primary justice. Uh, restorative justice is all the stuff we do or the way we understand things in Ethiopia or with homeless and banned or with the own sin in, in my own heart, my own weirdness, whatever it is, things that are not as they ought to be, the work that we do to bring those back into alignment is restorative justice. Does that make sense? Okay, truth is what is, justice is what ought to be. Restorative justice is the work to bring things back into to place. So I use this kind of juxtaposition of justice and truth to define justice because you wouldn't believe how few people have actually had justice defined for them. Um, it's not just giving money to the poor. Justice is right relationship with God, myself, others, and creation. It's this really deep, rich, universal concept. The next phrase is this, um, the Lord looked and he was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one and he was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So after all of what God has done with the judges and Noah's flood and the prophets and, and taking this people of Israel out, giving them the law, all of what he has done to try and bring about a just society, something that would reflect his kingdom on earth, all of this, there's still no justice. After all this time, there's still no justice and there's nobody to intervene and to really set things right. And so it's this fascinating kind of huge statement. And then God says, so uh, there's no one to intervene. He's appalled that there's no one to intervene. So his own arm worked salvation for him. And his own righteousness sustained him. And then it continues and it gives this messianic prophecy that we take to be reflective of Jesus. And it says this, he put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. And so I, I typically usually preach from that. What's wild about me getting to come to Mary's song is, do you see what's going on here? He's performed mighty deeds with his arm, and then we go right into the same thing. He has restored or rectified or is um, reconciling the situation on earth to be as it ought to be. And so in other churches, they actually think I'm a heretic for a while because I, I go down that road on purpose because, um, and then I tell them I have four daughters, that I'm really not a heretic, and that usually softens things. Um, you can't really be a bad heretic if you have four daughters. But I say um, that there's this debate 
out there. It used to be with the conservative church that if you talked about justice, people would get really squeamish. If it's liberal, you're on the slippery slope to the social gospel. Um, and so for a lot of the 20th century, talk, just talking about justice was a bit sketchy. When we started the Justice Conference, there was actually whole debates um, with an organization and, and a board where they were, they were debating whether we could use the word justice for the Justice Conference. That's 2009. It's amazing how much has changed in four or five years. I don't think anyone or, or any church that I know of would now say, like, we're squeamish about the word justice. A lot has changed, right? So it's a really, the conversation on justice is a very fast-moving conversation. Um, but here's where the conversation is at. People are going to go, yeah, we get justice. We get that that's an okay thing, that it's a good thing, that it's a biblical thing. But it's, it's not, you got to understand, it's not a part of the gospel. And so we, we have to be very careful that we protect the gospel, just the gospel and only the gospel. And so your justice stuff that you're talking about, it's good and all, but it's one layer out, it's works, and so you, you got to be really careful with that. Now, some of the mentors I've had when I was in grad school and in seminary, some of the people that I really look up to will say this, and I think they're absolutely dead wrong. And I think it's because they, they don't do their definition work up front. When you start with defining justice as being synonymous with works, then, then of course it's not going to be in the gospel because um, the Bible says works doesn't, doesn't belong in the gospel. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, but they're exactly, they're, they're dead wrong that justice isn't a part of the gospel because when you understand what justice is, it's the way things ought to be. The primary justice is the, the way that it actually reflects the beauty and the glory of God. Restorative justice is the working back to um, the idea that it reflects the beauty and the glory of God and that Jesus, the incarnation, is the, the arm, the right arm of God breaking into the world because there was no other way to truly restore things back to the way they ought to be. Does that make sense? Jesus' mission was restorative justice. Jesus came to reconcile the world back to God to the way things ought to be. The incarnation is the inbreaking of the right arm of God to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And so when we understand the gospel or the good news, we understand it, I think we have to understand it, as being the very moment that the angel Gabriel says to Mary, I've got good news for you. And when he goes to the, the shepherds and repeats, the, the host of angels come to the shepherds and they say, we bring you glad tidings of great joy. Those are the first times we actually see the phrase good news show up in the gospels. The good news begins with the proclamation of Jesus, the coming of Jesus, the right arm of God breaking into the world. That's when the light begins to dawn. And then the good news is also the, the life of Jesus that he lives when he feeds the hungry and he heals the sick and he brings down the lofty when he judges Pharisees and other leaders and he exalts the humble by saying of women who broke alabaster jars of perfume over his head that this is an act of faith and from now on to the end of time when you talk about me I want you to talk about this woman not that elite religious ruler in Jerusalem or the guy with all the degrees or whatever it might be God um, Jesus is exalting the humble and bringing down so his life reflects it and then his death on the cross um, is this final moment of atoning for sins so that we could stand blamelessly with God and then his resurrection is a part of the good news um, Paul argues this if Jesus didn't rise from the dead then we're to be pitied Jesus' resurrection is part of the good news. And Jesus' ascension so that the Holy Spirit could come. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the enabling power of the Holy Spirit to help us live into freedom, live into joy, and become Christ-like as we go. So the problem that happens in America right now is that we are too atonement-centric with our gospel. We think it's all about the transaction when I trade uh, my bad stuff with Jesus' good stuff and that that's the good news. And the problem with that, if we, if we think that is the, the, sum, you know, the, the sum total of the good news, is that we're mistaken the means for the ends, okay? The means for the ends. The big question with something is not the how, but the why. Why? 
It's, it's not how do we get saved, it's that we do get saved. It's the what. It's, it's, the, it's why is Jesus dying for our sins so that, the why. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's an incredible thing when you take the tool and you think that's the whole thing. Let me explain it to you a different way, and I've, I've said this before, but I always try and tell this to churches when I'm speaking uh, out there, is that if the, if the atonement, if the death of Jesus atoning for our sins was the ball game, Okay, then when at the end of Matthew, Jesus dies and the heavens quake and they shake and the earth rumbles um, and the veil is rent in two, if, if the atonement was really the ball game, do you remember that? You've got the, the, the altar in the temple and then when you go further into the temple, you have the Holy of Holies where God's spirit is dwelling and you've got this veil separating a holy God from people who are not holy who are not able to stand in the presence of God. And when the, earth's, um, when the earth quakes and the heavens roar when Jesus dies, we see in Matthew that the temple veil is rent from top to bottom, symbolizing that the barrier between God and man has now been removed by the death of Jesus. Right? If it was all about the, the substitutionary atonement of the death of Jesus, that we get um, that his, his, his receiving the penalty for our sins substitutes in for us, that substitutionary atonement, does that make sense, that phrase? If that's the whole ballgame, then that altar would have cracked. Symbolizing never again does, does there need to be a sacrifice. Never again does something need to be punished for the sins of people. Never again do you need atonement. That would have been the ballgame. But the, the altar and the forgiveness of sins was always a mechanism or a means or a tool so that people could come be in the, in the presence of God, in the fellowship of God. And now that Jesus died once the righteous for the unrighteous, that veil rips and we can come boldly before the throne of God. So substitutionary atonement or Jesus' death on the cross is a mechanism by which we come back into relationship with God. So the good news is not about a transaction of salvation. The good news is about a restoration of relationship. And when we start with this idea that Christianity is about a transaction where, whereby I get permission to then go to heaven, it, it really falls into this kind of consumer mentality where it's all about me at the center and, and manipulating the religious kind of um, ritualistic rites and, and, and passages and whatever it might be, rather than saying, the, the God I was estranged from, I've now been able to be adopted back into that family. Um, things are the way they ought to be once again with regard to relationship. And so um, this idea that justice isn't a part of the gospel, I think, is incoherent. It's incoherent. And so to pastors that I talk to that try and argue with me, I, I end up being a bit facetious and, and sarcastic because sar sarcasm really works in showing truth, right? And, uh, and so I, and I've, I've done, I've said this to you guys before, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll say this to you. I'm like, so here's so what I'll say is, okay, so I think you've, you've finally got me. I think you're arguing me into your position here, but I just want to make sure I understand the gospel, right? So let me see if, if I can say what the gospel is and then tell me if I'm understanding you correctly. And they're like, okay. And I'm like, okay, so the gospel is um, this, this idea that I get to swap places with Jesus so that the unjust get to stand next to a just God as if we're just through a process of justification whereby we're justified. But, but it doesn't have anything to do with justice. Am I, am, I, am I getting it right? And usually, you know, the eyes kind of roll back and it's like, well, I've, I've, I don't know that I've ever thought about it that way, right? Um, but I think this is incredibly important. Um, Isaiah says that God gets to a point where he says, I'm going to write myself into the story. I'm going to write my son into the story that he once and for all will be able to bring about the restoration of things, the reconciliation of all things. That this is the heart of the good news, that our relationship is able to be res restored, that things are able to be put back the way they ought to be. Uh, and when and when Jesus comes, it's the beginning of that work, and the good news starts there. And the good news continues all the way to the sending of the Holy Spirit, whereby we're sealed and given the ability to grow up into things, the kingdom of God, and to be able to live lives the way we ought to be, little by little by little, right? And so when we, we get really hyper-focused on the transaction, we're missing 
the whole thing. So to me, I come to Mary's song, and I read this, and I'm like, holy cow. S- somehow this shows up in Mary's understanding of what God is doing with her, that she's with child, that the good news is beginning, that God's arm is doing something mighty, and that the outworking of this is going to be justice, that, that it's all coming to restore things, to reconcile things, and that salvation is a part of that. But salvation is really being taken from this situation and brought back into the right situation. That's what salvation means. It's restoration, it's reconciliation, and it's all relationship-based. And so that's why when Paul says, man, we've been reconciled to God, and then we've been given the beauty of walking out and and getting to take part in this ministry of reconciliation. In other words, we've been um, the subject of God's work in restoring things, and now we get to be the doers and and the ones enjoying that, that same kind of movement of the Holy Spirit through us, including us, Um, using us to be able to bring that ministry of reconciliation to other people, which is not just a message of transaction, but it's a definitive work of God whereby people can be restored unto him out of the situation they're in. And that's a work of justice. It's motivated by a heart for justice, a desire for justice, a love for people. And so when we look at Jesus, his, his very nature as the right arm of God is about justice. He understood himself that way because when he stood up and read from the scroll, he proclaimed that the, that the day has now come, the year of the Lord's favor, to do all these things that, that people have been groaning and waiting for. And that ultimately when he says it's finished, this work has been accomplished, he then commissions us to go and do likewise. The one command Jesus gave was to love. And then he actually said, said, so strongly am I identified with this call and this move towards justice that when you stand here on the gospel um, as Christians, you think that to move towards the poor and toward justice is moving out on a limb that begins to feel like maybe I'm on a slippery slope, maybe I'm really out there, and so we run back to where it's safe, the gospel. He goes, that, that's... That's kind of the way it feels, doesn't it, with justice. And, and so we begin to think that way. It's like Wilson. You remember Wilson um, Castaway, Tom Hanks? Remember he's on the raft, and Wilson, the volleyball, starts floating away, and he's got a rope, and he's swimming after Wilson, and he's like, Wilson! And then he gets to the point where he's at the end of his rope, and Wilson's still out there, and he has to, like, let the volleyball go, you know, like... Because otherwise he's going to be too far from the raft. So he goes, that's kind of, I think, the way churches that I interact with sometimes feel about justice. We can go only so far, but if we go any further, we risk losing the main thing and swapping out um, a periphery issue or something that's not the main thing for the main thing. We're not going to let that happen. And I think that's such a false thinking that when Jesus says, let me, let me put it to you this way, Matthew 25, um, I'm going to separate out two kinds of people, and I'm going to separate these ones. They're going to go to be with my father, and they're going to go, so what happened? And they're going to go, well, you fed me when I was hungry. You clothed me when I was naked. You visited me when I was in prison. So now go and enter the, the pleasure of being with God. They're going to go, when did we, you know, I mean, what's going on? Then, then he's going to judge the other ones. They're going to be like, how come we're getting judged? Well, because you didn't do these things for me. You didn't clothe me. You didn't feed me. You didn't visit me in prison. They're like, well, we're not, when, I mean, really, when did we see you? We're not dumb, Jesus. We know an A-lister when we see one. We all do, right? So if we had seen you, we would have flocked to you. We would have gotten your autograph and visited you. And, um, you know, so, so obviously you're wrong. You're mistaken. We didn't see you. You didn't come because we would have done those things. And Jesus says, no, you don't understand. Whatever you didn't do for the least of these, you didn't do for me. And so you get something really interesting that Jesus is saying there are people that are getting religion right and quote unquote the gospel right over here that are really careful not to stray to the margins. And Jesus is like, you actually got it wrong. If you, if you come out here and stand in the margins, you stand with me and you stand for me. And it's as if you're actually doing whatever it is you're doing to me directly. This is where relationship's at. And so when we don't understand 
the true definition of justice, how that works into what God is doing with Jesus and what Jesus' purpose is, then we think doctrine and kind of substitutionary things in the gospel is over here, and we've got to be careful not to get pulled to the margins. A right understanding of the nature and the work and the purpose of Jesus makes us realize standing on justice, standing in the margins, there's no better place to stand. There's no closer place to stand that this is the heart of the good news, and this is where we're going to find the greatest relationship, following our Lord, our Savior, our King, and joining with Him as He works out reconciliation and restorative justice in this world. Amen? So when we come to Mary, I mean, look at this. There it is. When we come to Christmas, when we come to the Nativity, when we come to presents underneath the tree, when we come to thinking of a... a, uh, a girl on the margins, you know, liberation theology is, um, whether you know about it or not, it was a movement kind of born in the South America and the, the struggle for social justice, and it's, it's got problems. But one of the things it brought to us is I think it, it was an, uh, a corrective to some of the ways in which we read Scripture. And what liberation theology was saying was you have to read Scripture through, through the eyes of the oppressed, not through the eyes of empire. And I think there's something healthy about us understanding that if we were Roman citizens, empire, in this day, it would be like, um, translating it into today's language, it would be like a, a, an illegal immigrant girl um, who's 15-year-old, pregnant outside of wed- wedlock, that lives outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico, and is somehow called down to a slum outside of Mexico City to report for a census, um, And God is going to make her the dominant face of art in history. That God is going to make her the one closest to the scene of what he's going to do in restoring all things the way they ought to be. That I mean, do you know how strange that would sound to our ears? I mean, mean, mind-blowing how strange that would sound to our ears. That a Palestinian Jewish girl from Nazareth going down to a little town, Bethlehem, outside of Jerusalem, on the outskirts um, of of poverty. This is crazy upending our categories for understanding God. And when we wrap our minds around who she is, when we wrap our, our minds around what God is doing with his mighty arm to restore things, to bring the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, because isn't that what we're supposed to pray for? And if we're supposed to pray for it, then how can we not grapple with the fact that somehow this is a part of the plan of God? Would Jesus have us pray for something that's not part of the plan of God? And so we have to begin to think like a kingdom again, that that God really does desire for us to begin to live out his will on earth as it is in heaven, to reflect um, the kingdom as it ought to be, to live out justice and mercy and love. Let's pray, and uh, we're going to take this morning's offering. Father, we, um, we live in a day, we live in a time, we live in a culture, and we come at your scripture always through that lens and that perspective. Sometimes maybe it helps, sometimes, oftentimes maybe it gets in the way. I pray for myself, I pray for my family, I pray for this church that it wouldn't be our own ideas of what you're doing or our our own ideas of Jesus or our own ideas of how salvation should work that would begin to inform our our Christian understanding. I pray that it would be your scriptures. I pray that it would be what you've always been about doing. I pray that it would be the things you prophesied and then the things you fulfilled, that these things, the more that we can get at them and understand what, what you've accomplished, and that we get to join and be a part of. The more we understand your heart for people, I pray that these things would inform our our Christian understanding. Let us truly be a light in this community, we pray in Jesus' name.